Juvenile, Satire 1. What? Am I to be a listener only all my days? Am I never to get my word in? I that have been so often bored by Theseid of the ranting Cordus. Shall this one have spouted to me his comedies, and that one his love ditties, and I be unavenged? Shall I have no revenge on one who has taken up the whole day with an interminable Telphus, or with an Orestes, which, after filling the margin at the top of the roll, and the back as well, hasn't even yet come to an end? No one knows his own house so well as I know the groves of Mars and the cave of Vulcan near the cliffs of Aeolus. What the winds are brewing, whose souls Aeacus was on the rack, from what country another worthy is carrying off that stolen golden fleece. How big are the ash trees which Monicus tosses about? These are the themes with which Fronto's plain trees and marble halls are forever ringing until the pillars quiver and quake under the continual recitations. Such is the kind of stuff you may look for from every poet, greatest or least. While I too have slipped my hand from under the cane, I too have counseled Sulla to retire from public life and sleep his fill, it is a foolish clemency when you jostle against poets at every corner to spare paper that will be wasted anyhow. But if you can give me time, and will listen quietly to reason, I will tell you why I prefer to run in the same course over which the great nursling O Arunka drove his steeds. When a soft eunuch takes to matrimony, and Mavia, with spear in hand and breasts exposed to pig-sticking, when a fellow, under whose razor my stiff youthful beard used to great challenges, with his single wealth the whole nobility, when a gutter-snipe of the Nile like Crispinus, a slave-born denizen of Canopus, hitches a Tyrian cloak onto his shoulder, whilst on his sweating finger he airs a summer ring of gold, unable to endure the weight of a heavier gem, it is hard not to write satire. For who can be so tolerant of this monstrous city, who, so iron of soul, as to contain himself when the brand new litter of lawyer Matho comes along, filled with his huge self, after him, one who has informed against his noble patron, and will soon despoil our pillaged nobility of what remains to them, one whom Massa dreads, whom Carus propitiates by a bribe, and to whom Thamile was made over by the terrified Latinus. When you are thrust to one side by men who earn legacies by nightly performances, and are raised to heaven by that now royal road to high preferment, the favors of an aged and wealthy woman, each of the lovers will have his share. Proculius, a twelfth part, Gillo, eleven parts, each in proportion to the magnitude of his services. Let each take the price of his own blood, and turn as pale as a man who has trodden upon a snake barefooted, or of one who awaits his turn to orate before the altar at Logdono. Why tell how my heart burns hot with rage when I see the people hustled by a mob of retainers attending on one who has defrauded and debauched his ward? or on another who has been condemned by a futile verdict for what matters infamy if the cash be kept. The exiled Marius carouses from the eighth hour of the day and revels in the wrath of heaven, while you, poor province, win your cause and weep. Must I not deem these things worthy of the Venusian's lamp? Must I not have my fling at them? 
Should I do better to tell tales about Hercules or Diomede, or the bellowing in the labyrinth, or about the flying carpenter and the lad who splashed into the sea, and that in an age when the compliant husband, if his wife may not lawfully inherit, takes money from her paramour, being well trained to keep his eyes upon the ceiling, or to snore with wakeful nose over his cups, an age when one who has squandered his family fortunes upon horse flesh thinks it right and proper to look for the command of a cohort. See him dashing at breakneck speed, like a very automedon, along the Flaminian way, holding the reins himself, while he shows himself off to his great-coated mistress. Would you not like to fill up a whole notebook at the street crossings when you see a forger, borne upon the necks of six porters, and exposed to view on this side and on that in his almost naked litter, and reminding you of the lounging Mycenas, one who, by help of a scrap of paper and a moistened seal, has converted himself into a fine and wealthy gentleman? Then up comes a lordly dame, who, when her husband wants a drink, mixes toad's blood with his old Kellenian, and improving upon Lucusta herself, teaches her artless neighbors to brave the talk of the town and carry forth to burial the blackened corpses of their husbands. If you want to be anybody nowadays, you must dare some crime that merits narrow Gaiara or a jail. Honesty is praised and starves. It is to their crimes that men owe their pleasure grounds and high commands, their fine tables and old silver goblets with goats standing out in relief. Who can get sleep for thinking of a money-loving daughter-in-law seduced of bribes that have lost their virtue, or of adulterers not out of their teens? Though nature say me nay, Indignation will prompt my verse, of whatever kind it be, such verses as I can write, or Cluvianus. From the day when the rain clouds lifted up the waters, and Deucalion climbed that mountain in his ship to seek an oracle, that day when the stones grew soft and warm with life, and Pyrrha showed maidens in nature's garb to men, all the doings of mankind, their vows, their fears, their angers, and their pleasures, their joys and goings to and fro, shall form the motley subject of my page. For when was vice more rampant? When did the maw of avarice gape wider? When was gambling so reckless? Is it a simple form of madness to lose a hundred thousand sesterces and not have a shirt to give to a shivering slave? Which of our grandfathers built such numbers of villas, or dined by himself off in seven courses? Look now at the meager dole set down upon the threshold for a toga-clad mob to scramble for. The patron first peers into your face, fearing that you may be claiming under someone else's name. Once recognized, you will get your share. He then bids the crier call up the Trojan-blooded nobles, for they too besiege the door as well as we. The praetor first, says he, and after him the tribune. But I was here first, says a freedman who stops the way. Why should I be afraid or hesitate to keep my place, though born on the Euphrates, a fact which the little windows in my ears would testify, though I myself denied it? Yet I am the owner of five shops, which bring me in four hundred thousand sesterces. What better thing does the broad purple bestow if a Corvinus herds sheep for daily wage in the Laurentian country while I possess more property than either a palace or a Lycinus. So let the tribunes await their turn. Let money carry the day. Let the sacred office give way to one who came but yesterday with whitened feet into our city. For no deity is held in such reverence among us as wealth. Though as yet, O baneful money, thou hast no temple of thine own, not yet have we reared altars to money, 
in like manner as we worship peace and honor, victory and virtue, or that concord that twitters when we salute her nest. If, then, the great officers of state reckon up at the end of the year how much the dole brings in, how much it adds to their income, what shall we dependents do, who out of the self-same dole have to find ourselves in coats and shoes, in the bread and fire of our homes. A mob of litters comes in quest of the hundred farthings. Here is a husband going the round, followed by a sickly or pregnant wife. Another, by a clever and well-known trick, claims for a wife that is not there, pointing in her stead to a closed and empty chair. My gala's in there, says he. Let us off quick, will you not? Gala, put out your head. Don't disturb her, she's asleep. The day itself is marked out by a fine round of business. First comes the dole, then the courts, and Apollo learned in the law, and those triumphal statues among which some Egyptian Arabarch or other has dared to set up his titles, against whose statue more than one kind of nuisance may be committed. Wearied and hopeless, the old clients leave the door. Though the last hope that a man relinquishes is that of a dinner, the poor wretches must buy their cabbage and their fuel. Meanwhile, their lordly patron will be devouring the choicest products of wood and sea, lying alone upon an empty couch. For off those huge and splendid antique dinner tables, he will consume a whole patrimony at a single meal. Ere long, no parasites will be left. Who can bear to see luxury so mean? What a huge gullet to have a whole boar, an animal created for conviviality, served up to it. But you will soon pay for it, my friend, when you take off your clothes and with distended stomach carry your peacock into the bath undigested. Hence a sudden death and an intestate old age, the new and merry tale runs the round of every dinner table, and the corpse is carried forth to burial amid the cheers of enraged friends. To these ways of ours, posterity will have nothing to add. Our grandchildren will do the same things, and desire the same things that we do. All vice is at its acme. Up with your sails, and shake out every stitch of canvas. Here, perhaps, you will say, Where find the talent to match the theme? Where find that freedom of our forefathers to write whatever the burning soul desired? What man is there that I dare not name? What matters it whether Mucius forgives my words or no? But just describe Tigellinus, and you will blaze amid those faggots in which men with their throats tightly gripped stand and burn and smoke, and you trace a broad furrow through the middle of the arena. What? Is a man who has administered aconite to half a dozen uncles to ride by and look down upon me from his swaying cushions? Yes, and when he comes near you, put your finger to your lip. He who but says the word, that's the man, will be counted an informer. You may set Aeneas and the brave Rutulian a fighting with an easy mind. It will hurt no one's feelings to hear how Achilles was slain, or how Hylas was searched for when he tumbled after his pitcher. But when Lucilius roars and rages as if with sword in hand, the hearer, whose soul was cold with crime, grows red. He sweats with the secret consciousness of sin, hence wrath and tears. So turn these things over in your mind before the trumpet sounds, the helmet once donned. It is too late to repent you of the battle. Then I will try what I may say of those worthies whose ashes lie under the Flaminian and Latin roads. Satire 2 I would fain flee to Sarmatia and the frozen sea when people who ape the Curie 
and live like bacchanals, dare talk about morals. In the first place, they are unlearned persons, though you may find their houses crammed with plaster casts of Chrysippus, for their greatest hero is the man who has bought a likeness of Aristotle or Pitacus, who bids his shelves preserve an original portrait of Cleanthes. Men's faces are not to be trusted. Does not every street abound in gloomy-visaged debauchees? And do you rebuke foul practices when you are yourself the most notorious of the Socratic reprobates? A hairy body and arms stiff with bristles give promise of a manly soul. But the doctor grins when he cuts into the growths on your shaved buttocks. Men of your kidney talk little. They glory in taciturny and cut their hair shorter than their eyebrows. Parabomius himself is more open and more honest. His face, his walk, betray his distemper. And I charge destiny with his failings. Such men excite your pity by their frankness. The very fury of their passions wins them pardon. Far worse are those who denounce evil ways in the language of a Hercules, and after discoursing upon virtue, prepare to practice vice. Am I to respect you, Sextus, quoth the ill-famed Varillus, when you do as I do? How am I worse than yourself? Let the straight-legged man laugh at the club-footed, the white man at the blackamoor, but who could endure the Gracchi railing at sedition? Who will not confound heaven with earth and sea with sky if Verves denounce thieves or Milo cutthroats? If Claudius condemns adulterers or Catiline upbraid Cathegus or if Sulla's three disciples inveigh against proscriptions? Such a man was that adulterer who after lately defiling himself by a union of the tragic style, revived the stern laws that were to be a terror to all men, I even to Mars and Venus, at the moment when Julia was relieving her fertile womb and giving birth to abortions that displayed the similitude of her uncle. Is it not, then, right and proper that the very worst of sinners should despise your pretended scurry and bite back when bitten? Laronia could not contain herself when one of these sour-faced worthies cried out, What of your Julian law? Has it gone to sleep? To which she answered smilingly, Oh, happy times to have you for a censor of our morals. Once more may Rome regain her modesty. A third Cato has come down to us from the skies. But tell me, where did you buy that balsam juice that exhales from your hairy neck? Don't be ashamed to point out to me, the shopman. If the laws and statutes are to be raked up, you should cite first of all the Scantinian. Inquire first into the things that are done by men. Men do more wicked things than we do, but they are protected by their numbers and the tight-locked shields of their phalanx. Male effeminates agree wondrously well among themselves. Never in our sex will you find such loathsome examples of evil. Do we women ever plead in the courts? Are we learned in the law? Do your courthouses ever ring with our bawling? Some few of us are wrestlers. Some of us eat meat rations. You men spin wool and bring back your tail of work and baskets. When it is done, you twirl round the spindle big with fine thread more deftly than Penelope, more delicately than Arachne. Doing work such as an unkempt drab squatting on a log would do, 
Everybody knows why Hister left all his property to his freedman, why in his lifetime he gave so many presents to his young wife. The woman who sleeps third in a big bed will want for nothing. So when you take a husband, keep your mouth shut. Precious stones will be the reward of a well-kept secret. After this, what condemnation can be pronounced on women? Our censor absolves the crow and passes judgment on the pigeon. While Laronia was uttering these plain truths, the would-be Stoics made off in confusion. For what word of untruth had she spoken? Yet what will not other men do when you, Creticus, dress yourself in garments of gauze, and while everyone is marveling at your attire, launch out against the proculi and the politi? Fabula is an adulteress. Condemn Carfinia of the same crime, if you please, but however guilty, they would never wear such a gown as yours. Oh, but you say these July days are so sweltering. Then why not plead without clothes? Such madness would be less disgraceful. A pretty garb, yours in which to propose or expound laws to our countrymen flushed with victory and with their wounds yet unhealed, and to those mountain rustics who had laid down their plows to listen to you, what would you not exclaim if you saw a judge dressed like that? Would a robe of gauze sit becomingly on a witness? You, Creticus, you, the keen, unbending champion of human liberty, to be clothed in a transparency. This plague has come upon us by infection, and it will spread still further, just as in the fields the scab of one sheep or the mange of one pig destroys an entire herd, just as one bunch of grapes takes on its sickly color from the aspect of its neighbor. Some day you will venture on something more shameful than this dress. No one reaches the depths of turpitude all at once. In due time you will be welcomed by those who in their homes put fillets round their brows, swath themselves with necklaces, and propitiate the bona dia with the stomach of a porker and a huge bowl of wine. Though by an evil usage the goddess warns off all women from the door, none but males may approach her altar. Away with you profane women is the cry. No booming horn, no she-minstrels here. Such were the secret torchlight orgies with which the bapti wearied the Cacropian Catuto. One prolongs his eyebrows with some damp soot on the edge of a needle and lifts up his blinking eyes to be painted. Another drinks out of an obscenely shaped glass and ties up his long locks in a gilded net. He is clothed in blue checks or smooth-faced green. The attendant swears by Juno like his master. Another holds in his hand a mirror like that carried by the effeminate Otho, a trophy of the Aruncan actor, in which he gazed at his own image in full armor when he was just ready to give the order to advance. A thing notable and novel in the annals of our time, a mirror among the kit of civil war. It needed, in truth, a mighty general to slay Galba and keep his own skin shaved. It needed a citizen of highest courage to ape the splendors of the palace on the field of Bebriacum and plaster his face with dough. Never did the quiver-bearing Semiramis, the like in her Assyrian realm, nor the despairing Cleopatra on board her ship at Actium. No decency of language is there here, no regard for the manners of the table. You will hear all the foul talk and squeaking tones of Sibyl. A gray-haired, frenzied old man presides over the rites. 
He is a rare and notable master of the art of gluttony, and should be hired to teach it. But why wait any longer when it were time, in Phrygian fashion, to lop off the superfluous flesh? Gracchus has presented to a cornet player, or perhaps it was a player on the straight horn, a dowry of 400,000 sesterces. The contract has been signed, the benedictions have been pronounced, the banqueters are seated, the new-made bride is reclining on the bosom of her husband. O oh, ye nobles of Rome, is it a soothsayer that we need, or a censor? Would you be more aghast? Would you deem it a greater portent? If a woman gave birth to a calf, or if an ox to a lamb, the man who is now arraying himself in the flounces and train and veil of a bride once carried the quivering shields of Mars by the sacred thongs and sweated under the sacred burden. O father of our city, whence came such wickedness among thy Latin shepherds? How did such a lust possess thy grandchildren, O Gradivus? Behold, here you have a man of high birth and wealth being handed over in marriage to a man, and yet neither shakest thy helmet, nor smitest the earth with thy spear, nor yet protesteth to thy father. Away with thee, then, be gone from that broad martial plain which thou hast forgotten. I have a ceremony to attend, quoth one, at dawn to-morrow in the Quirinal Valley. What's the occasion? No need to ask. A friend is taking to himself a husband. Quite a small affair, yes, and if we only live long enough, we shall see these things done openly. People will wish to see them reported among the news of the day. Meanwhile, these would-be brides have one great trouble. They can bear no children wherewith to keep the affection of their husbands. Well has nature done in granting to their desires no power over their bodies. They die infertile. Not avails them the medicine chest of the bloated lady, or to hold out their hands to the blows of the swift-footed lubricy. Greater still the portent, when Gracchus, clad in a tunic, played the gladiator and fled trident in hand across the arena. Gracchus, a man of nobler birth than the Capitolini, or the Marcelli, or the descendants of Catullus or Paulus, or the Fabii, nobler than all the spectators in the podium, not excepting him who gave the show at which that net was flung. That there are such things as manes, and kingdoms below ground, and punt poles, and stygian pools black with frogs, and all those thousands crossing over in a single boat, these things not even boys believe, except such as have not had their penny bath. But just imagine them to be true. What would Curius and the two Scipiais think? Or Fabricius? and the spirit of Camillus, what would the legion that fought at Cremera think, or the young manhood that fell at Cannae, what would all those gallant hearts feel when a shade of this sort came down to them from here? They would wish to be purified, if only sulfur and torches and damp laurel branches were to be had. Such is the degradation to which we have come. Our arms, indeed, we have pushed beyond Juverna's shores to the new-conquered Orcades and the short-knighted Britons. But the things which we do in our victorious city will never be done by the men whom we have conquered. And yet they say that one Zalakis, an Arminian, more effeminate than any of our youth, has yielded to the ardor of a tribune. Just see what evil communications do. He came as a hostage, 
But here, boys are turned into men. Give them a long sojourn in our city, and lovers will never fail them. They will throw away their trousers and their knives, their bridles and their whips, and carry back to our taxita the manners of our Roman youth. Satire 3 Though put out by the departure of my old friend, I commend his purpose to fix his home at Kumai, and to present one citizen to the Sibyl. That is the gate of Baie, a sweet retreat upon a pleasant shore. I myself would prefer even Prokuta to the Sabura, for where has one ever seen a place so dismal and so lonely that one would not deem it worse to live in perpetual dread of fires and falling houses and the thousand perils of this terrible city? and poets spouting in the month of August. But while all his goods and chattels were being packed upon a single wagon, my friend halted at the dripping archway of the old Porta Capena. Here Numa held his nightly assignations with his mistress. But now the holy fount and grove and shrine are let out to Jews, who possess a basket and a truss of hay for all their furnishings. For as every tree nowadays has to pay toll to the people, the muses have been ejected, and the wood has to go a-begging. We go down to the valley of Egeria, and into the caves so unlike to nature. How much more near to us would be the spirit of the fountain if its waters were fringed by a green border of grass, and there were no marble to outrage the native tufa. Here spoke Umbritius. Since there is no room, quoth he, for honest callings in this city, no reward for labor, since my means are less today than they were yesterday, and to-morrow will rub off something from the little that is left. I purpose to go to a place where Daedalus put off his weary wings, while my white hairs are recent, while my old age is erect and fresh, while Lycesis has something left to spin, and I can support myself on my own feet without slipping a staff beneath my hand. Farewell, my country. Let Artorius live there, and Catullus. Let those remain who turn black into white, and to whom it comes easy to take contract for temples, rivers, or harbors, for cleansing drains, or carrying corpses to the pyre, or to put up slaves for sale under the authority of the spear. These men once were horn-blowers who went the round of every provincial show, and whose puffed-out cheeks were known in every village. Today they hold shows of their own, and win applause by slaying with a turn of the thumb whomsoever the mob bids them slay. From that they go back to contract for cesspools, and why not for any kind of thing, seeing that they are of the kind that fortune raises from the gutter to the mighty places of earth whenever she wishes to enjoy a laugh. What can I do at Rome? I cannot lie. If a book is bad, I cannot praise it and beg for a copy. I am ignorant of the movements of the stars. I cannot and will not promise to a man his father's death. I have never examined the entrails of a frog. I must leave it to others to carry to a bride the presents and messages of a paramour. No man will get my help in robbery, and therefore no governor will take me on his staff. I am treated as a maimed and useless trunk that has lost the power of its hands. What man wins favor nowadays unless he be an accomplice, one whose soul seethes and burns with secrets that must never be disclosed? No one who has imparted to you an innocent secret thinks he owes you anything or will ever bestow on you a favor. The man whom Varys loves is the man whom can impeach Varys at any moment that he chooses. 
Ah, let not all the sands of the shaded Tagus and the gold which it rolls into the sea be so precious in your eyes that you should lose your sleep and accept gifts to your sorrow which you must one day lay down and be for ever a terror to your mighty friend. And now let me speak at once of the race which is most dear to our rich men, and which I avoid above all others. No shyness shall stand in my way. I cannot abide quirites, a Rome of Greeks, and yet what fraction of our dregs comes from Greece? The Syrian Orontes has long since poured into the Tiber, bringing with it its lingo and its manners, its flutes and its slanting harp-strings, bringing to the timbrels of the breed, and the trolls who are bidden ply their trade at the circus. Out upon you, all ye that delight in foreign strumpets with painted headdresses, your country clown Quirinus now trips to dinner in Greek-fangled slippers, and wears Nikitarian ornaments upon a seromatic neck. One comes from lofty Sicyon, another from Amidon or Andros, another from Samos, Trales, or Alabanda, all making for the Esculine, or for the hill that takes its name from Osiobids, all ready to worm their way into the houses of the great and become their masters. Quick of wit and of unbounded impudence, they are as ready of speech as Isaias, and more torrential. Say, what do you think that fellow there to be? He has brought with him any character you please. Grammarian, orator, geometrician, painter, trainer, or rope dancer, augur, doctor, or astrologer. All sciences a fasting monsieur knows, and bid him go to hell, to hell he goes. In fine, the man who took to himself wings was not a Moor, nor a Sarmatian, nor a Thracian, but one born in the very heart of Athens. Must I not make my escape from purple-clad gentries like these? Is a man to sign his name before me, or recline upon a couch above mine, who has been wafted to Rome by the wind which brings us our damsons and our figs? Is it to go so utterly for nothing that as a babe I drank in the air of the Aventine, and was nurtured on the Sabine berry? What of this again, that these people are experts in flattery, and will commend the talk of an illiterate, or the beauty of a deformed, friend and compare the scraggy neck of some weakling to the brawny throat of Hercules when holding up Antaeus from the earth, or go into ecstasies over a squeaky voice not more melodious than that of a cock when he pecks his spouse the hen. We no doubt can praise the same things that they do, but what they say is believed. Could any actor do better when he plays the part of Theus, or of a matron, or of the nude Doris? You would never think that it was an actor that was speaking, but a very woman, complete in all her parts. Yet in their own country neither Antiochus nor Stratocles, neither Demetrius nor the delicate Haemus will be applauded. They are a nation of play-actors. If you smile, your Greek will split his sides with laughter. If he sees his friend drop a tear, he weeps. Though without grieving, if you call for a bit of fire in winter time, he puts on his cloak. If you say, I am hot, he breaks into a sweat. Thus we are not upon a level, he and I. He has always the best of it, being ready at any moment by night or by day, to take his expression from another man's face, to throw up his hands and applaud if his friend spit or hiccup nicely, or if his golden basin make a gurgle when turned upside down. Besides all this, there is nothing sacred to his lusts, not to mention of the family nor the maiden daughter, not the as yet unbearded son-in-law to be, 
not even the as yet unpolluted sun. If none of these be there, he will debauch the grandmother. These men want to discover the secrets of the family, and so make themselves feared. And now that I am speaking of the Greeks, pass on to the schools, and hear of a graver crime, the Stoic, who informed against and slew his own young friend and disciple, was born on that river bank where the Gorgon's winged steed fell to earth. No, there is no room for any Roman here. Some Protogenes or Diphilus or Harmachus rules the roost, one of who by a defect of his race never shares a friend but keeps him all to himself. For once he has dropped into a facile ear one particle of his own and his country's poison, I am thrust from the door, and all my long years of servitude go for nothing. Nowhere is it so easy as at Rome to throw an old client overboard. And besides, not to flatter ourselves, what value is there in a poor man's serving here in Rome, even if he be at pains to hurry along in his toga before daylight, seeing that the praetor is bidding the lictor to go full speed, lest his colleague should be the first to salute the childless ladies Albina and Modia, who have long ago been awake. Here in Rome, the son of freeborn parents has to give the wall to some rich man's slave, for that other will give as much as the whole pay of a legionary tribune to enjoy the chance favours of a Calvina or a Catiana, while you, when the face of some gay-decked harlot takes your fancy, scarce venture to hand her down from her lofty chair. At Rome you may produce a witness as unimpeachable as the host of Idaean goddess, Numa himself might present himself, or he who rescued the trembling Minerva from the blazing shrine. The first question asked will be as to his wealth, the last about his character. How many slaves does he keep? How many acres does he own? How big and how many are his dinner dishes? A man's word is believed in exact proportion to the amount of cash which he keeps in his strong box. Though he swear by all the altars of Samothrace or of Rome, the poor man is believed to care not for gods and thunderbolts, the gods themselves forgiving him. And what of this? That the poor man gives food and occasion for jest if his cloak be torn and dirty, if his toga be a little soiled, if one of his shoes gapes where the leather is slit, or if some fresh stitches of coarse thread reveal where not one but many a rent has been patched. Of all the woes of luckless poverty, none is harder to endure than this, that it exposes men to ridicule. Out you go for very shame, says the marshal, out of the knight's stalls, all of you whose means do not satisfy the law. Here let the sons of panders born in any brothel take their seats. Here let the spruce son of an auctioneer clap his hands with the smart sons of a gladiator on one side of him and the young gentleman of a trainer on the other. Such was the will of the numbskull Otho, who assigned to each of us his place. Whoever was approved as a son-in-law, if he was short of cash, and no match for the money-bags of the young lady. What poor man ever gets a legacy, or is appointed assessor to an edile? Romans, without money, should have marched out in a body long ago. It is no easy matter anywhere for a man to rise when poverty stands in the way of his merits. But nowhere is the effort harder than in Rome, where you must pay a big rent for a wretched lodging, a big sum to fill the bellies of your slaves, and buy a frugal dinner for yourself. You are ashamed to dine off Delph, but you would see no shame in it if transported suddenly to a Marzian or Sabine table, where you would be pleased enough to wear a cape of coarse Venetian blue. There are parts of Italy, to tell the truth, in which no man puts on a toga until he is dead. 
even on days of festival, when a brave show is made in a theatre of turf, and when the well-known farce steps once more upon the boards, when the rustic babe on its mother's breast shrinks back affrighted at the gaping of the pallid masks, you will see stalls and populace all dressed alike, and the worshipful aediles content with white tunics as vesture for their high office. In Rome, everyone dresses above his means, and sometimes something more than what is enough is taken out of another man's pocket. This failing is universal here. We all live in a state of pretentious poverty. To put it shortly, nothing can be had in Rome for nothing. How much does it cost you to be able now and then to make your bow to Cosus, or to be vouchsafed one glance with lip firmly closed from Viento? One of these great men is cutting off his beard. Another is dedicating the locks to a favorite. The house is full of cakes, which you will have to pay for. Take your cake, and let this thought rankle in your heart. We clients are compelled to pay tribute and add to a shaved menial's perquisites. Who at cool Preneste or at Volsinii amid its leafy hills was ever afraid of his house tumbling down? Who in modest Gabii or on the sloping heights of Tivoli? But here we inhabit a city propped up for the most part by slender flute players. But that is how the bailiff patches up the cracks of the old wall, bidding the inmates sleep at ease under a roof ready to tumble about their ears. No, no, I must live where there are no fires, no nightly alarms. Ucalagon below is already shouting for water, shifting his chattels. Smoke is pouring out of your third-floor attic above, but you know nothing of it. For if the alarm begins on the ground floor, the last man to burn will be he who has nothing to shelter him from the rain but the tiles where the gentle doves lay their eggs. Codrus possessed a bed too small for the dwarf Procula, a marble slab adorned by six pipkins, with a small drinking cup and a recumbent Chiron below, and an old chest containing Greek books whose divine lays were being gnawed by unlettered mice. Poor Codrus had nothing, it is true, but he lost that nothing, which was his all, and the last straw in his heap of misery is this, that though he is destitute and begging for a bite, no one will help him with a meal, no one offer him board or shelter. But if the grand house of Astoricus be destroyed, the matrons go dishevelled, your men will put on mourning, the praetor adjourns his court, then indeed do we deplore the calamities of the city and bewail its fires. Before the house has ceased to burn, up comes one with a gift of marble or of building materials. Another offers nude and glistening statues. A third, some notable work of Euphranor or Polyclitus or bronzes that have been the glory of old Asian shrines. Others will offer books and bookcases, or a bust of Minerva, or a hundred weight of silver plate. Thus does Perseus, that most sumptuous of childless men, replace what he has lost with more and better things, and with good reason incurs the suspicion of having set his own house on fire. If you can tear yourself away from the games of the circus, you can buy an excellent house at Sora at Fabrateria or Forcino, for what you now pay in Rome to rent a dark garret for a year, and you will there have a little garden, with a shallow well from which you can easily draw water, without need of rope, to bedew your weekly plants. There make your abode, mattock in hand, tending a trim garden fit to feast a hundred Pythagoreans, it is something in whatever spot, however remote, to have become the possessor of a single lizard. Most sick people here in Rome perish for want of sleep. The illness itself 
having been produced by food lying undigested in the fevered stomach. For what sleep is possible in a lodging? Who but the wealthy get sleep in Rome? There lies the root of the disorder, the crossing of wagons in the narrow winding streets, the slanging of drovers when brought to a stand, would make sleep impossible for a drusus or a sea-calf. When the rich man has a call of social duty, the mob makes way for him as he is borne swiftly over the heads in a huge Liburnian car. He writes or reads or sleeps as he goes along, for the closed window of the litter induces slumber. Yet he will arrive before us. Hurry as we may, we are blocked by a surging crowd in front, and by a dense mass of people pressing in on us from behind. One man digs an elbow into me, another a sedan pole, one bangs a beam, another a wine cask against my head. My legs are beplastered with mud, huge feet trample on me from every side, and a soldier plants his hobnails firmly on my toe. See now the smoke rising from that crowd which hurries for the daily dole. There are a hundred guests each followed by a kitchener of his own. Corbolo himself could scarce bear the weight of all the big vessels and other gear which that poor little slave is carrying with head erect, fanning the flame as he runs along. Newly patched tunics are torn in two. Up comes a huge log swaying on a wagon, and then a second dray carrying a whole pine tree, towering aloft and threatening the people. For if that axle with its load of Ligurian marble breaks down and pours its spilt contents onto the crowd, what is left of their bodies? Who can identify the limbs? Who the bones? The poor man's crushed corpse disappears just like his soul. At home, meanwhile, the folk, unwitting, are washing the dishes, blowing up the fire with distended cheek, clattering over the greasy flesh scrapers, filling the oil flasks, and laying out the towels, while each of them is thus busy over his own task. Their master is already sitting, a new arrival upon the bank, and shuddering at the grim ferryman. He has no copper in his mouth to tender for his fare, and no hope of a passage over the murky flood." And now regard the different and diverse perils of the night. See what a height it is to that towering roof from which a potsherd comes crack upon my head every time that some broken or leaky vessel is pitched out of the window. See with what a smash it strikes and dints the pavement. There's death in every open window as you pass along at night. You may well be deemed a fool, improvident of sudden accident if you go out to dinner without having made your will. You can but hope, and put up a piteous prayer in your heart, that they may be content to pour down on you the contents of their slop pails. Your drunken bully, who has by chance not slain his man, passes a night of torture like that of Achilles when he bemoaned his friend, lying now upon his face and now upon his back. He will get no rest in any other way, since some men can only sleep after a brawl. Yet however reckless the fellow may be, however hot with wine and young blood, he gives a wide berth to those whose scarlet cloak and long retinue of attendants, with torches and brass lamps in their hands, bid him keep his distance. But to me, who am wont to be escorted home by the moon, or by the scant light of a candle whose wick I husband with due care, he pays no respect. Here, how the wretched fray begins, if fray it can be called when you do all the thrashing and I get all the blows. The fellow stands up against me and bids me halt. Obey I must. What else can you do when attacked by a madman stronger than yourself? Where are you from? shouts he. Whose swipes and whose beans have blown you out? 
With what cobbler have you been munching cut leeks and boil sheep head? What, sirrah, no answer? Speak out or take that upon your shins. Where is your stand? In what prayer shop shall I find you? Whether you venture to say anything or make off silently, it's all one. He will thrash you just the same and then in a rage take bail from you. Such is the liberty of the poor man. Having been pounded and cuffed into a jelly, he begs and prays to be allowed to return home with a few teeth in his head. Nor are these your only terrors. When your house is shut, when bar and chain have made fast your shop, and all is silent, you will be robbed by a burglar, or perhaps a cutthroat will do for you quickly with cold steel. For whenever the Pontine marshes and the Gallinarian forests are secured by an armed guard, all that tribe flocks into Rome as into a fish preserve. What furnaces, what anvils are not groaning with the forging of chains? This is how our iron is mostly used, and you may well fear that ere long none will be left for ploughshares, none for hoes and mattocks. Happy were the forebears of our great-grandfathers, happy the days of old, which under kings and tribunes beheld Rome satisfied with a single jail. To these I might add more and different reasons. But my cattle call, the sun is sloping, and I must away. My muleteer has long been signalling to me with his whip, and so farewell forget me not, and if ever you run over from Rome to your own Aquinum to recruit, summon me too from Cumae to your Helvine Ceres and Diana. I will come over to your cold country in my thick boots to hear your satires, if they think me worthy of that honour. Satire 4 Crispinus, once again, a man whom I shall often have to call on to the scene, a prodigy of wickedness without one redeeming virtue, a sickly libertine, strong only in his lusts, which scorn none save the unwedded. What matters it, then, how spacious are the colonnades which tire out his horses? How large the shady groves in which he drives! How many acres near the forum! How many palaces has he bought! No bad man can be happy, least of all the incestuous seducer with whom lately lay a filleted priestess, doomed to pass beneath the earth with the blood still warm within her veins. Today I shall tell of a less heinous deed, Though, had any other man done the like, he would fall under the censor's lash. For what would be shameful in good men, like Seus or Teus, sat gracefully on Crispinus? What can you do when the man himself is more foul and monstrous than any charge you can bring against him? Crispinus bought a mullet for six thousand sesterces, one thousand sesterces for every pound of fish, as those who would say who make big things bigger in the telling of them. I could commend the man's cunning if by such a lordly gift he secured the first place in the will of some childless old male, or, better still, sent it to some great lady who rides in a close prod widowed litter, but nothing of the sort. He bought it for himself. We see many a thing done nowadays which poor niggardly Apicus never did. What? Did you, Crispinus, you who once wore a strip of your native papyrus round your loins, give that price for a fish? A price bigger than you have need paid for the fisherman himself, a price for which you might buy a whole estate in some province, or a still larger one in Apulia. 
What kind of feasts are we supposed were guzzled by our emperor himself when all those thousands of sesterces forming a small fraction, a mere side dish of a modest entertainment were belched up by a purple-clad parasite of the August Palace. One who is now chief of the knights, and who once used to hawk at the top of his voice a broken lot of his fellow countrymen, the Sprats. Begin, Calliope, let us take our seats. This is no mere fable, but a true tale that is being told. Tell it forth, ye maidens of Pieria, and let it profit me that I have called you maids. What time the last of the Flavii was flaying the half-dying world, and Rome was enslaved to a bald-headed Nero, there fell into a net in the Sea of Hadria, in front of the shrine of Venus, that stands in Dorian Ancona, a turbot of wondrous size, filling up all its meshes, a fish no less than those which the lake Maeotis conceals beneath the ice till it is broken up by the sun, and then sends forth, torpid through sloth, and fattened by long cold, to the mouths of the Pontic Sea. This monster, the master of the boat and line, designs for the high pontiff. For who would dare to put up for sale, or to buy so big a fish, in days when even the seashores were crowded with informers? The inspectors of seaweed would straightway have taken the law of the poor fishermen, ready to affirm that the fish was a runaway that had long feasted in Caesar's fish ponds, escaped from thence, he must needs be restored to his former master. For if Palfurius is to be believed, or Armelatus, every rare and beautiful thing in the wide ocean, in whatever sea it swims, belongs to the imperial treasury, the fish, therefore, that it be not wasted, shall be given as a gift. And now, death-bearing autumn was giving way before the frosts, fevered patients were hoping for a quartan, and bleak winter's blasts were keeping the booty fresh. Yet on sped the fisherman as though the south wind were at his heels, and when beneath him lay the lake where Alba, though in ruins, still holds the Trojan fire and worships the lesser Vesta, a wandering crowd barred his way for a while. As it gave way, the gates swung open on easy hinge, and the excluded fathers gazed on the dish that had gained an entrance. Admit it to the presence. Receive, quoth he of Picinum, a fish too big for a private kitchen. Be this kept as a festive day, Hasten to fill out thy belly with good things, and devour a turbot that has been preserved to grace thy reign. The fish himself wanted to be caught. <laughs> Could flattery be more gross? Yet the monarch's comb began to rise. There is nothing that divine majesty would not believe concerning itself when lauded to the skies. But no platter could be found big enough for the fish. So a council of magnates is summoned, men hated by the emperor, and on whose faces sat the pallor of that great and perilous friendship. First to answer the Ligurian's call, haste, haste, he is seated, was Pegasus. Hastily catching up his cloak, he that had newly been appointed as bailiff over the astonished city. For what else but bailiffs were the prefects of those days? Of whom Pegasus was the best, and the most righteous expounder of the law, though he thought that even in those dread days there should be no sword in the hand of justice. Next to come in was the aged genial Crispus, whose gentle soul well matched his style of eloquence. No better adviser than he, 
for the ruler of lands and seas and nations, had he been free under that scourge and plague to denounce cruelties and proffer honest counsels. But what can be more dangerous than the ear of a tyrant on whose caprice hangs the life of a friend who has come to talk of the rain or the heat or the showery spring weather? So Crispus never struck out against the torrent, nor was he one to speak freely the thoughts of his heart and stake his life upon the truth. Thus was it that he lived through many winters and saw his eightieth solstice protected even in that court by weapons such as these. Next to him hurried Achilles, of like age as himself, and with him the youth who little merited the cruel death that was so soon hurried on by his master's sword. But to be both young and noble has long since become a prodigy, hence I would rather be a giant's little brother. Therefore it availed the poor youth nothing that he speared Numidian bears, stripped as a huntsman upon the Alban arena, for who nowadays would not see through patrician tricks? Who would now marvel, Brutus, at that old world cleverness of yours? Tis an easy matter to be fool a king that wears a beard. No more cheerful in face, though of ignoble blood came Rubrius, condemned long since of a crime that may not be named, and yet more shameless than a reprobate who should write satire. There too was present the unwieldy frame of Montanus and Crispinus, reeking at early dawn with odors enough to outsent two funerals, more ruthless than he, Pompeius, whose gentle whisper would cut men's throats, and Fuscus, who planned battles in his marble halls, keeping his flesh for the Dacian vultures. Then again, with the sage Viento, came the death-dealing Catullus, who burnt with love for a maiden whom he had never seen, a mighty and notable marvel even in these days of ours, a blind flatterer, a dire courtier from a beggar's stand, well fitted to beg at the wheels of chariots and blow soft kisses to them as they roll down the Arachian hill. None marveled more at the fish than he, turning to the left as he spoke, only the creature happened to be on his right. In like fashion would he commend the thrusts of a Cilician gladiator, or the machine which whisks up the boys into the awning. But Viento was not to be outdone, and like a seer inspired, O Bellona, by thine old gadfly, he bursts into prophecy. A mighty presage hast thou, O Emperor, of a great and glorious victory. Some king will be thy captive, or Arvirigus will be hurled from his British chariot. The brute is foreign-born. Dost thou not see the prickles bristling upon his back? Nothing remained for Fabricius but to tell the turbot's age and birthplace. What then do you advise? quoth the emperor. Shall we cut it up? Nay, nay, rejoins Montanus. Let that indignity be spared him. Let a deep vessel be provided to gather his huge dimensions within its slender walls. Some great and unforeseen Prometheus is destined for the dish. Haste, haste, with clay and wheel. But from this day forth, O Caesar, let potters always attend upon thy camp. This proposal, so worthy of the man, gained the day. Well known to him were the old debauches of the imperial court, which Nero carried on to midnight, till a second hunger came, and veins were heated with hot Falernian. No one in my time had more skill in the eating art than he. 
He could tell at the first bite whether an oyster had been bred at Circeae, or on the Lucrine rocks, or on the beds of Rutupiae. One glance would tell him the native shore of a sea urchin. The council rises, and the councillors are dismissed. Men whom the mighty emperor had dragged in terror and hot haste to his Alban castle, as though to give them news of the Cati, or the savage Sicambri, or as though an alarming dispatch had arrived on wings of speed from some remote quarter of the earth. And yet would that he had rather given to follies such as these all the days of cruelty when he robbed the city of its noblest and choicest souls, with none to punish or avenge, he could steep himself in the blood of the Lamii, but when once he became a terror to the common herd, he met his doom. Satire 5 If you are still unashamed of your plan of life, and still deem it to be the highest bliss to live at another man's board, if you can brook indignities which neither Sarmentus nor the despicable Gaba would have endured at Caesar's ill-assorted table, I should refuse to believe your testimony, even upon oath. I know of nothing so easily satisfied as the belly, but even granted that you have nothing wherewith to fill its emptiness, is there no key, vacant, no bridge? Can you find no fraction of a beggar's mat to stand on? Is a dinner worth all the insults with which you have to pay for it? Is your hunger so importunate, when it might with greater dignity be shivering where you are, and munching dirty scraps of dog's bread? First of all, be sure of this, that when bidden to dinner, you receive payment in full for all your past services. A meal is the return which your grand friendship yields you. The great man scores it against you, and though it come but seldom, he scores it against you all the same. So if after a couple of months it is his pleasure to invite his forgotten client, lest the third place on the lowest couch should be unoccupied, and he says to you, Come and dine with me. You are in the seventh heaven. What more can you desire? Now at last has Trebius got the reward for which he must needs cut short his sleep, and hurry with shoestrings untied, fearing that the whole crowd of callers may already have gone their rounds at an hour when the stars are fading, or when the chilly wane of Bootis is wheeling slowly round. And what a dinner, after all! You are given wine that fresh-clipped wool would refuse to suck up, and which soon converts your revelers into corribants. Foul words are the prelude to the fray, but before long tankards will be flying about. A battle royal with sanguine crockery will soon be raging between you and the company of freedmen, and you will be staunching your wounds with a blood-stained napkin. The great man himself drinks wine bottled in the days when consuls wore long hair, and the juice which he holds in his hand was squeezed during the social wars, but neither a glass of it will he send to a friend suffering from dyspepsia. Tomorrow he will drink a vintage from the hills of Alba or Setia, whose date and name have been effaced by the soot which time has gathered upon the aged jar, such wine as Thracia and Helvidius used to drink with chaplets on their heads upon the birthdays of Cassius and the Bruti. The cup in Vero's hands is richly crusted with amber and rough with barrel. To you no gold is entrusted, or if it is, a watcher is posted over it to count the gems and keep an eye on your sharp fingernails. Pardon his anxiety, that fine jasper of his is much admired. For Vero, like so many others, transfers from his fingers to his cups the jewels with which the youth preferred 
to the jealous Yarbus used to adorn his scabbard. To you will be given a cracked cup with four nozzles that takes its name from a Beneventine cobbler and calls for sulfur wherewith to repair its broken glass. If my lord's stomach is fevered with food and wine, a decoction colder than Thracian hoarfrosts will be brought to him. Did I complain just now that you were given a different wine? Why, the water which you clients drink is not the same. It will be handed to you by a Gaetulian groom, or by the bony hand of a blackamoor, whom you would rather not meet at midnight when driving past the monuments on the hilly Latin way. Before mine host stands the very pink of Asia, a youth bought for a sum bigger than the entire fortune of the warlike Tullus or Ancus, more valuable, in short, than all the chattels of all the kings of Rome. That being so, when you are thirsty, look to your swarthy Ganymede. The page who has cost so many thousands cannot mix a drink for a poor man. But then his beauty, his youth, justify his disdain. When will he get as far as you? When does he listen to your request for water, hot or cold? It is beneath him to attend to an old dependent. He is indignant that you should ask for anything, and that you should be seated while he stands. All your great houses are full of saucy slaves. See with what a grumble another of them has handed you a bit of hard bread that you can scarce break in two, or lumps of dough that have turned moldy stuff that will exercise your grinders, and into which no tooth can gain admittance. For Vero himself, a delicate loaf is reserved, white as snow, and kneaded of the finest flour. Be sure to keep your hands off it. Take no liberties with the bread basket. If you are presumptuous enough to take a piece, there will be someone to bid you put it down. What, sir, impudence! Will you please fill yourself from your proper tray, and learn the colour of your own bread? What, you ask? Was it for this that I would so often leave my wife's side on a spring morning and hurry up the chilly esquiline, when the spring skies were rattling down the pitiless hail, and the rain was pouring in streams off my cloak? See now, that huge lobster being served to my lord, all garnished with asparagus. See how his lordly breast distinguishes the dish, with what a tail he looks down upon the company, borne aloft in the hands of that tall attendant. Before you is placed, on a tiny plate, a crab hemmed in by half an egg, a fit banquet for the dead. The host susses his fish in venafran oil, and sickly greens offered to you, poor devil, will smell of the lamp, for the stuff contained in your cruets was brought up the Tiber in a sharp, proud Numinian canoe, stuff which prevents anyone at Rome sharing a bath with Bokhar, and which will even protect you from a black serpent's bite. My lord will have a mullet dispatched from Corsica, or the rocks of Tarominium, for in the rage for gluttony our own seas have given out. The nets of the fish markets are forever raking our home waters, and prevent Tyrrhenian fish from attaining their full size. And so the provinces supply our kitchens. From the provinces come the fish for the legacy hunter Laenus to buy, and for Aurelia to send to market. Vero is served with a lamprey, the finest that the straits of Sicily can purvey, for so long as the south wind stays at home, and sits in his prison house drying his dank wings, Charybdis has no terrors for the daring fisherman. For you is reserved an eel, first cousin to a water snake, or perchance a pike mottled with ice spots. He too was bred on Tiber's banks, and was wont to find his way into the inmost recesses of the Sabura battening himself amid its flowing sewers. And now one word with the great man himself, if he will lend his ear. 
No one asks of you such lordly gifts as Seneca or the good Piso or Cotta used to send to their humble friends, for in the days of old the glory of giving was deemed grander than title or fasces. All we ask of you is that you should dine with us as a fellow citizen. Do this and remain, like so many others nowadays, rich for yourself and poor to your friends. Before Vero is put a huge goose's liver, a capon as big as a goose, and a boar piping hot worthy of yellow-haired Meliager's steel. Then will come truffles. If it be springtime, and the longed-for thunder have enlarged our dinners, keep corn to yourself, O Libya, says Aladius, unyoke your oxen, if only you send us truffles. During all this time, lest any occasion for disgust should be wanting, you may behold the carver capering and gesticulating with knife in hand and carrying out all the instructions of his preceptor, for it makes a mighty difference with what gesture a hair or a hen be carved. If you ever dare to utter one word as though you were possessed of three names, you will be dragged by the heels and thrust out of doors as Cacus was after the drubbing he got from Hercules. When will Vero offer to drink wine with you, or take a cup that has been polluted by your lips? Which one of you would be so foolhardy, so lost to shame, as to say to your patron, A glass with you, sir? No, no, there's many a thing which a man whose coat has holes in it cannot say. But if some god, or godlike mannequin, more kindly than the fates, should present you with four hundred thousand sesterces, oh, how great a personage would you become from being a nobody! How dear a friend to Vero! Pray help Trebius to this. Let Trebius have some of that. Would you like a cut just from the loin, good brother? Oh, money, money! It is to you that he pays this honor. It is you that are his brother. Nevertheless, if you wish to be yourself a great man, and a great man's lord, let there be no little Aeneas playing about your halls, nor yet a little daughter more sweet than he. Nothing will so endear you to your friend as a barren wife. But as things are now, though your Michele pour into your paternal bosom three boys at birth, Vera will be charmed with the chattering brood, and will order cuirasses of green rushes to be given them, and little nuts and pennies too if they be asked for, when the little parasites present themselves at his table. Before the guests will be placed toadstools of doubtful quality. Before my lord, a noble mushroom, such a one as Claudius ate before that mushroom of his wife's, after which he ate nothing more. To himself and the rest of the Viros, he will order apples to be served, whose scent alone would be a feast. Apples such as grew in the never-failing autumn of the Phaeacians, and which you might believe to have been filched from the African sisters. You are treated to a rotten apple, like those munched on the ramparts by a monkey, equipped with a spear and a shield, who learns in terror of the whip to hurl a javelin from the back of a shaggy goat. You may, perhaps, suppose that Vero grudges the expense, not a bit of it. His object is to give you pain. For what comedy, what mime, is so amusing as a disappointed belly. His one object, let me tell you, is to compel you to pour out your wrath in tears, and to keep gnashing your molars against each other. You think yourself a free man, and guest of a grandee. He thinks, and he is not far wrong, that you have been captured by the savory odors of his kitchen. And for who that had ever worn the Etruscan bulla in his boyhood, or even the poor man's leather badge, could tolerate such a patron for a second time, 
however destitute he might be. It is the hope of a good dinner that beguiles you. Surely he will give us, you say, what is left of a hare, or some scraps of a boar's haunch. The remains of a capon will come our way by and by. And so you all sit in dumb silence, your bread clutched, untasted, and ready for action. Entreating you thus, the great man shows his wisdom. If you can endure such things, you deserve them. Some day you will be offering your head to be shaved and slapped, nor will you flinch from a stroke of the whip, well worthy of such a feast and such a friend. <laughs>